organism's perspective, we can view resistance as either intrinsic or acquired. This is a concept that I think a lot of people struggle with and one that more explanation is really required. So intrinsic resistance is something that we should consider to be natural. It's constitutive for the organism and it isn't something acquired. This isn't what we're talking about when we're talking about superbugs. It's normal, it's expected, it's part of that organism's physiology. Acquired resistance is not inherent to the organism. These are the superbugs. They have a gene or a mutation or something which differentiates them from the wild type and allows them to survive in the presence of an antimicrobial, which they would not normally be able to do. This is the resistance we're concerned with, and this is the emerging threat and problem that we're dealing with. You can find a lot of information about intrinsic resistance on the UCAST website, so ucast.org. In this table, we can see that the Enterobacteriales and Aeromonas are all intrinsically resistant to benzyl penicillin, so this is kind of original penicillin, the glycopeptides, lipoglycopeptides, fusidic acid, most of our macrolides, the lincosamides, streptogramins, rifampin, and oxazolidinones. And then we have our species-specific intrinsic resistance. So for instance, Klebsiella pneumonia complex is intrinsically resistant to ampicillin and amoxicillin. So this is not a superbug. This is a normal Klebsiella pneumonia. This is really important to know because it helps you to interpret your susceptibility reports you receive back from the laboratory. Ideally, labs will not report ours where we have intrinsic resistance. And so when you have a, a report that comes back with very few S's, um, this can help you to contextualize that. A group of organisms that I think veterinarians should be aware of are the spice organisms. So a number of genera here, Serratia, Providentia, indole positive protea, which includes Proteus vulgaris and Morganella species, Citrobacter, and Entrobacter. These bugs are all intrinsic producers of AMP-C beta-lactamases. So this is a type of degradative enzyme that can break down many of our penicillin-type drugs, as well as the third-generation cephalosporins. I think it's important to be aware of this because knowing that the spice organisms are intrinsically resistant to the third-generation cephalosporins means that you can empirically choose a more appropriate therapy once you have that preliminary report back from the lab. So they've identified the organism, told you what it is, but they haven't had time to do their susceptibility testing yet. You know you've got an enterobacter, so you know you should avoid beta-lactams. In a veterinary context, I would recommend avoiding all beta-lactams for treating spice organisms. How do we actually determine antimicrobial susceptibility? Well, there's a few different methods. Um, we have categorical tests, which only tell you whether an organism is susceptible or resistant. And then we have quantitative methods. These give you an MIC, a minimum inhibitory concentration, which describes exactly how susceptible or resistant an organism is. It quantifies it. It gives you an actual number and concentration. The MIC is defined as the lowest concentration of a drug that inhibits bacterial growth. It inhibits, it doesn't necessarily kill the organism. And by convention, the MIC is reported uh, as a number on a doubling dilution scale. So 0 0.12, 0 0.25, 0 0.5124, et cetera, micrograms per milliliter. We can further divide susceptibility test methods into diffusion-based and dilution-based. Our diffusion-based assays include the Kirby-Bauer disk diffusion, which provides only categorical results, and gradient strips or e-tests, which give us quantitative. We can actually get an MIC. And then dilution-based methods, which are always quantitative, whether it's agar dilution or broth dilution. This is an example of Kirby-Bauer disk diffusion testing. And the way that we perform this test is we inoculate our Mueller-Hinton agar plate with a lawn of bacteria standardized to a density of McFarlane 0.5. We then place antimicrobial containing disks on the surface of that plate, incubate overnight, and then inspect for inhibitory zones, which are measured. 
For those of you here in Saskatoon, we'll have a chance to actually perform this test in the laboratory portion of this class, but I've put a link to an explainer video that actually demonstrates the procedure above. Gradient strips are another method we can use, which is technically very similar to performing disk testing. So we have our same standardized Mueller-Hinton plate, we put our lawn of bacteria, this McFarlane 0.5 suspension, and then place our gradient strip on uh, the, the plate afterwards. We incubate overnight, um, but instead of measuring the diameter of this inhibitory zone, what we do is actually inspect it for where it intersects with the gradient strip. So here you can see that this teardrop shape inhibitory zone intersects at approximately the six, so six micrograms per milliliter. And by convention, we would round this up to eight. So the MIC of this organism is eight micrograms per milliliter. Broth microdilution is another commonly used assay where we can determine MICs to a whole panel of drugs at the same time. This is a commercially prepared uh, kit. We have these 96 well plates, which contain lyophilized antimicrobials. We add a suspension of bacteria to these plates using, a, in this case, an auto inoculator machine, incubate it overnight, and inspect for pellets of growth. So if we zoom in on just these wells here, you can see we have tetracycline contained in all five concentrations from 1 through 16 micrograms per milliliter. And if you look carefully, I think you can appreciate that we have pellets of growth in these first four wells, but not in this last one. So our minimum inhibitory concentration would therefore be 16 micrograms per milliliter. Just like the Kirby Bauer disk testing, you'll have a chance to see this method in the laboratory session of this class but I've put a link to a demonstration video above. Once we have our susceptibility test results, either our zone diameters or our minimum inhibitory concentrations, we have to interpret them. Because these results need to be predictive of clinical outcome, it's critical that we use standardized interpretive criteria. There's the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, the CLSI out of the United States, and the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing, or UCAST. Here we have an excerpt from the UCAST interpretive criteria for the enterobacteriales for both the penicillins and aminoglycosides. And the way that we use these interpretive criteria is first to find the drugs that we're interested in. So for instance, ampicillin, we can see that an E. coli isolate would be considered susceptible to ampicillin if it had an MIC of less than or equal to 8 micrograms per milliliter, and it would be considered resistant if it had an MIC of greater than 8 micrograms per milliliter. If we were to do disc diffusion testing using a disc of a, a standard uh, antibiotic mass, 10 micrograms, it would be considered susceptible if it had a zone diameter of greater than or equal to 14 millimeters and resistant if it was less than 14 millimeters. I mentioned earlier that this interpretation is designed to be clinically predictive. And so you need to be aware of uh, what the intended use of, of each product is. And if we look at the interpretive criteria from the CLSI, this is the table that I've reproduced from, from their data, we can see exactly what the resistance breakpoint is based on. So first of all, uh, it's based on the species, both the species of bacteria and the host, so what animal we're treating. It's based on the indication, so whether it's for a skin and soft tissue infection or a urinary tract infection, we know that drugs reach different concentrations at different sites of the body. So it's important that we're applying interpretive criteria that are particular to the type of infection that we're treating. It's particular to the drug. There's no one concentration that we can use for any, any drug organism uh, combination. And of course, the dosing regimen. So what is the dose and how frequently is it given? If in the course of treating a patient, any of these assumptions are violated, the predictive power of the susceptibility interpretation is lower than it would otherwise be. That's not to say that it isn't still useful or that a diagnostic lab can't provide you with valuable information. You just need to understand the limitations of the data.
interpretation of diagnostic tests is a critical component of the practice of veterinary medicine or medicine for physicians. Um, simply obtaining a test result is not sufficient. We need to interpret that text, that test in the full clinical picture. And in that interpretation, there's some really critical concepts. So what is the sensitivity and specificity of that test? What's the positive and negative predictive value? These are concepts that you may be more familiar with in a statistical context, but are actually directly applicable to your patient. Here I have a summary of this two by two table you've probably encountered before, where we have true positives, true negatives, test positives, test negatives, um, and, and our accompanying uh, true positive tests, true negative tests, uh, false positives and false negatives, along with the predictive values, sensitivity and specificity. What I think is really important for you to realize as future clinicians is that your patient population, your proportion of true positives and true negatives varies based on geography and also your clinical judgment. As a clinician, your ability to assess patients and select which tests you're going to apply to each population will affect the proportion of false positives and false negatives that you encounter. So in summary, um, we can think about the diagnostic process as starting with you using the problem-oriented approach to identify differential diagnoses. You then select and collect the appropriate samples required um, to run the appropriate assays. You ship your samples to the lab. The diagnostic lab then chooses the particular tests that they need based on your questions, which organisms or which targets you want them to screen for. The diagnostic test results are reported to you, um, but it's important to know that these are test results, not a diagnosis. In order to come up with that diagnosis, you have to interpret those results in the context of your patient, possibly requiring some follow-up with the lab, some additional testing, some clarification, and then you treat your diagnosis as appropriate. A couple of new terms today, intrinsic resistance and acquired resistance, and of course, some reflection questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.